uh, technology is uh, rapidly reshaping the way that uh, we uh, perceive, understand, and interact with our world. And we also see that brands and uh, organizations also see this change in their interaction with the consumer. And it is for, to this purpose that uh, we thought of setting up the digital disruption sessions as a forum, as a, a point of reference, if you want, as a conversation starter uh, to discuss the convergence of communications and technology. Uh, this is the second time we do it. We did it last year. Uh, and uh, uh, we have three very, very interesting sessions for you uh, this afternoon. The first session is, uh, is, uh, is focusing on uh, uh, business disruption. And we have some uh, great uh, entrepreneurs and executives that know a lot about business disruption with a global perspective. The second session we have is uh, focusing on the algorithm and uh, how the data we offer the, the algorithm uh, may uh, effectively be used against us in ways that we cannot uh, imagine or understand. Uh, and there we have Christopher Wiley with us, who is uh, uh, very famous because he is the whistleblower of the Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal a few uh, months ago. Uh, and the third session we have focuses on content. It focuses on uh, new ways to deliver content. Audio is something, is a, is a new revolution. Uh, and it also uh, focuses on niche content. That is content that is, uh, that is uh, uh, created uh, to uh, leverage particular communities. So uh, thank you very much for being here. I would like, first of all, to thank our speakers for being here today and being available today. I would like to thank the Delphi Economic Forum for their hospitality for the second year in a row. Uh, we feel very, very proud to be part of this uh, amazing organization. Uh, and I would also like to thank our sponsors who are Volvo, uh, Pernod Ricard, and Vodafone. And uh, more than anything, I would like to thank uh, the great Valuecom team who took this idea and actually turned it into reality. It's much more complicated than you can imagine. So, thank you very, very much. I hope you have an, a very interesting session. And uh, Eva Kaili will now moderate the first panel that deals with digital disruption. Thank you very much. Alex. Alex Manos is uh, starting uh, these digital disruption sessions and it's my second time too, so I'm really happy to participate again. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the first session, which is business disruption. It's actually my file in politics. We, uh, uh, we're trying to adapt to disruption and try to make sure that uh, when you're being disrupted, you're going to be positively disrupted, especially for the citizens. Um, one of the biggest business sectors uh, of our era, especially in Europe and very strong in the industry, is the automotive one. Uh, many think that uh, it's a slow adapter and uh, maybe sometimes too big and too complex to change. Um, we talk about uh, autonomous vehicles, it's happening, some, some people think it's happening slow. But actually we do have um, some companies that are really, really innovative. Um, we have Volvo Cars, which is a European company trying to, to lead this, uh, this change. And they're moving very, very fast in this transforming uh, world. Um, actually, they were named Disruptors of the Year, and we have the president and CEO who has a different vision than anybody would, uh, else would accept. Uh, his name is Hokan Samuelson, and um, he said he's planning to change completely the way his company is doing business. Um, first of all, embracing electrification. It's a big thing, especially, especially in Europe. And he's setting up uh, a new brand. It's going to be called Polestar, uh, which will be also a new standalone electrified car brand. And trying to start now, not in the future, not in 40 years. Some colleagues were telling me, hey, autonomous vehicles, they will happen in 40 years. No, actually 2019 and onwards, we have electric motor Volvo cars and they have agreed with Uber to sell them 24,000 autonomous driving compatible base cars for the next three years. So it's already here. And more than that, the objectives of this company, so we have completely new business models. Um, not, it's not for car sales. So in the future, he's not trying to have measurable targets to sell 
specific amount of cars. What he did is having a target to have direct consumer relations and uh, to make sure that this is the important thing and to transform actually to provide services. I'll give you an example. Instead of buying now a phone, some people cannot afford it, right? How about giving them one for free, but they have to use it and they have to allow you to track them and they can get and use your data. <coughs> they get a free device. So this is a completely new business model. And uh, I think that it's a future where vehicles, for example, they can be a shared utility and more than an owned asset. Own cars, but it's one of the most important players in this industry. So, inspired by this um, innovative vision, we have invited exceptional speakers and some really good friends. Um, I will start uh, with Basim uh, Haidar. He's the founder and CEO of uh, GMT Group and also of the channel IT Group. Alexis Pandazis, uh, co founder and executive director of Elas Direct. Dimitris Litsikakis, country manager Greece, Cyprus, and Malta of Revolut. And Ari Ganesaligam, Global Brand Communications Director of Sivas Regal, and uh, Bernard Ricard. So basically, how can we combine all these different businesses? I think disruption is here, the combination. They all change their business models. models. And I'm really uh, delighted to have you all here today and elaborate on what really um, happens when you disrupt the business. Um, I will start, as I said, with uh, Basim Haidar, and I would like to first say that it's an honor to have you with us. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, you have two leading organizations in finance and technology, um, and as I talked about new business models, and especially in fintech, we have a huge disruption. Uh, mobile finance, fintech solutions, especially for the unbacked people, are really, really important. They can change their lives. So. I would like to ask you, um, how do you think financial inclusion can play a role for the global economic growth? And if you believe that you actually redefine uh, what uh, the financial services are until now. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Eva. I, I'd like to just start by separating disruption and building. Um, I know we talk a lot about disruption and technologies out there, but the, the, the reality and the truth is, when we're addressing the digital economy, it's not always disruptive. So if you talk about emerging markets, for example, there's actually nothing to disrupt because there's simply no infrastructure. There's, there's uh, 1.7 billion unbanked uh, people in the emerging markets, most of them women, for example, that have never been on the financial systems. So when we're building technologies to reach these guys, what are we disrupting? Nothing. We're actually building what the banks did not do or the insurance companies did not do. Um, so this is how we like to see our business. Uh, the, 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 bi the biggest issue achieving this objective, and by the way, in over seven years, we've managed to reach 600 million people um, on our platform and using very complicated algorithms. But algorithms are worthless, totally worthless without data. Uh, where do you get data in markets where there's simply no uh, credit scores, uh, no bank records, uh, there's no e-governance or anything. So we had to resort to the traditional uh, companies like the mobile operators, uh, partly social media, uh, apps usage, to actually gather data to be able to create, uh, create scores and be able to build, I don't say disrupt, because I don't disrupt in what we do in our, in our business. Um, However, you mentioned something very interesting earlier, which is about the, uh, the handsets. Imagine you can't even gather data on someone that doesn't have simply a smart handset that you could actually mine that data. And what we realize is in emerging markets, and by the way, we operate in 36 countries, and all of them follow the same uh, approach to data. We realize that 95% of people voluntarily give data in order to qualify for services. This is very different than uh, the myth we have in the West about we're afraid about our data. Because maybe we have something in the West, but in the emerging markets, we don't. And therefore, people volunteer. We've asked people, do you allow us to read your SMSs? And they say yes, because they know that will improve their credit score, for example. And the reason we read an SMS is because when you do a transaction, you get uh, banking confirmation, balances, etc., and that improves your score. 
uh, we asked them to take to answer five questions about themselves, for example, and people volunteer this information. Um, by volunteering, now we, we are able to put people into the financial and the digital uh, systems. Of course, I mean, the, the, the biggest disruption I see with this is on humans more than anything else in industries. Because just imagine fast forward 20 years from now where drivers and trucks don't need people anymore. What happens to these people? Where do they get jobs? Are we teaching people for the jobs of the future? Are we teaching them technology? Are we looking at curriculums that we're still teaching in schools that are 30 and 40 years old? So I think this is, this is what we need to be discussing going forward in the future. Okay, so I, I have to ask you now. So you talk about uh, disruption that, in a positive way, actually, in a positive disruption. But yes, we might have uh, a lot of jobs uh, that are going to be lost. So I would like to ask you, if you can see where is the line ahead where mobile financial technology will not be seen as a disruptor, because you don't see it as a disruption, but uh, the traditional system might. Uh, might. And so when do we see the evolution of this? Or do you feel it's too far in the future? You talked about 20 years? It, no, not really, actually. It's starting mm. to happen. Over the last two years, we've been approached by banks saying, we've tried to do what you do, we can't do it. We're a bank, we're a financial institution, we're bricks and mortar, and this is how we operate. The way we analyze risk is very different than the way you do. You have all the algorithms, you've invested a lot of money into this. So how can we partner? And this is exactly the objective we wanted to achieve. It's now, <coughs> excuse me, we're getting financial institutions, insurance companies, banks, microfinance saying it costs us three to five hundred dollars to reach a customer in a remote area, and we need to lend this person a hundred or two hundred dollars. These are microloans. We can't afford to do this. We need you. So actually, the revolution is already happening. It's, it's more in the emerging markets. This, that's where my expertise is. We're seeing a lot of banks in Africa, down to Bangladesh, Pakistan, and so on, working very closely. And we've signed a lot of agreements with these guys. So it's happening. Um, so I would have just a final question. So you talk about people in regions where even to own a smartphone is luxury, right? So how, how do you find solutions there? So um, after three years of working on this project, we, we, we needed to put handsets in the hands of people. And we realized that people can't afford these handsets. But there are people who are willing to pay for these handsets. So um, we've managed to actually develop a smartphone that costs $27, yes, um, uh, Android-based. There's a collateral on the handset, meaning we embedded a technology that allows us to lock the handset remotely if the customer defaults. But you must remember that the phone is the livelihood of these people, so they will protect it. And uh, the defaults we have seen are actually below 2%. Now, how do, how, how do we give this phone? We talk to the mobile operators and we say, these people will buy a plan, but we need you to heavily subsidize the plan for us. So from the subsidy, we, we subsidize the phone to these guys. Two, we have the apps, so the Facebooks of this world, the Twitters, Instagram, all the content providers pay us to install apps on these phones uh, for these customers. In addition to this, we're actually talking to a few, uh, you might know, <laughs> a few um, uh, uh, funds, government funds, uh, the French, the Germans, the African Development Bank, and so on, and they've shown a lot of interest to actually invest in this to allow uh, more inclusion. So this is how we're getting these handsets into people's hands. Mostly by people that appreciate uh, having more data. Absolutely. Uh, that's very interesting. Um, uh, Alexis Pandazis. So we know each other several years when you were the most innovative company in insurance. And I think I've started also a contract with you. So you, I'm a client. How mature do you think now is the Greek audience to adopt cutting edge technology and AI, uh, because at that point, actually, they were not. So th thanks for that, and thanks for the invite. It's the second year that I'm, I'm coming here, and thank you for the invite, Alex. Uh, last year, we had an interesting discussion with the CEO of Inter-American, who we were on the same panel together. So that did not end up bloody, and that was pretty good. Um, for those of you who don't know Elas Direct, um, it was a company that, as Eva said, we started with Emilio, my business partner, about seven years ago. Uh, I'm not going to walk you through any slides, but you can leave that as background. But um, we decided, we, we both work in London, we decided to leave our jobs at Goldman Sachs and come and set up an insurance company. So the challenge number one is why Greece? The challenge number two is why an insurance company? And challenge number three is why on earth would somebody who's already insured with a traditional insurance company listen to our message? Um, I think starting with the first one, I, I think 
something that Basim said before, which I totally agree. In some markets like Greece, you're not really disrupting something, you're creating something. And to be very honest, although insurance is an obligatory thing that you have to buy, the way that it was being positioned to the consumer was very unfair. The consumer was overpaying for a service that was not really offered for a product that was subpar. So what we tried to do, and copying the examples of Amazon, people like that, trying to offer a better service, a better product at a better price, which sounds a bit cliche, um, but the consumer at the end of the day is very rational. I think coming back to Basim's point, you have to make a very early decision quickly whether you're trying to disrupt at a global level or at a regional level. I think companies that are based in Greece like ourselves and companies that are based in the region overall have a very different mandate than the Revoluts of the world or the Facebooks of the world or the LinkedIn of the world. There you have to focus on what is it that's so specific about Greece, what is it that's so specific about Cyprus, the Balkans, the Middle East that you can actually change. From our perspective, the consumer is more or less the same globally. They always want the same basic things. Am I getting value for money? Am I getting what I was promised? And am I being able to deliver on that promise as a counterparty of this transaction for a long time? And to Eva's point, I think in insurance, which is a, a, a particular industry, the moment of truth is really the claim. When you crash, is my insurance company going to be there? Are they going to pay? And when I call them, are they going to pick up? When I text them, are they going to reply and all that? Coming back to us, I think once you decide that you're not going to go for the global disruption, but you're going to go for the regional disruption, and once you figure out that Greece is a specific situation, it's not the same as Alabama, it's not the same as London, it's not the same as Asia, but the consumer has the same expectations, you have to start thinking about how can I get some of these best practices globally, how can I get some of these technologies globally, and adapt them to the Greek market. So if anything, if I were to characterize us as a company in the market, you're more or less like a chef that is getting the best ingredients globally, and you try to almost copy the best ideas, but you have to be very strict with yourself as to getting an app that works in California is not going to work in Greece. So I think, coming back to your point, Eva, I think the consumer is there. The consumer has always been there. What the people that have failed him are the people on the product side, the insurance companies in our case, the banks in the case of the banks and all that. How easy is it to transform? I think that's another interesting discussion. I think to be able to cater to the modern consumer, you have to be a very agile organization. It's an overused term, but it's quite important to understand it. It cannot be a hierarchical structure. It cannot be, um, you know, average age in the last director right now is 29 to 30 years old. The average insurance company in Greece is probably 65 years old average. So there is an element of, do you understand what the modern consumer is asking for? And are you flexible enough as an organization to learn from your mistakes and be able to fix things? I think that's another important thing that a lot of um, companies in our sector are, I wouldn't say blind to, but they're very hesitant in accepting. On the consumer side, our view, I'll give you a small example. We, we are, the consumer doesn't really care whether you're an insurance company, whether you're a bank that provides financing for the car, whether you're the taxman collecting tax revenue for the car that you own. They really care about the mobility ecosystem. So the minute you start thinking about ecosystems, then interesting plays start coming into the game like the handset of $27, like Volvo that you mentioned before, and all that. From our perspective, we see it with road assistance. Road assistance is offered in every single one of our packages. So every client of ours, when they have a breakdown, we'll come pick them up and take them to a garage. Problem number one in Greece, the garage are not online. So when you want to call a repair shop, you typically call. That's a 17 call example of calling, not picking up, calling again, not picking up, and all that. So building a platform that you onboard all these garages, you just created value for the consumer. The next step is to say, well, you're on the side of the street, I'll come and pick you up. We did a partnership with eFood that actually sends you coffee while you're waiting for the track. So you start seeing how different things can improve the customer experience. Who pays for it at the end of the day? We're actually linking up now financing at the end, microfinancing, to be able to give to the Greek consumer that doesn't have financing to fix their cars. You're getting the money from the bank that will actually pay in order to get access to this consumer at a time of need. So the minute you're an agile organization, the minute you can adopt some of these new technologies, the consumer is there willing and wanting. Then the question is how quickly can you bring a value proposition that makes sense? So that's kind of what we, how we're setting up our business. And it's a very short period of time, so obviously we don't have enough time to go through different things. But I think some of these key themes are quite important. Are you trying to disrupt globally or locally? Uh, are you agile enough to be able to disrupt? And the other thing is, are you in a regulated sector or a non-regulated sector? Because you have different degrees of freedom. Okay, so uh, a small question then. You know US and you know UK, you know two different markets, and then you come to Greece, which I think is a, a space where it's over-regulated and not very easy. Mm -hmm. So do you think uh, you, can, you should be local or you should be global? And how legislation maybe works? Because re regulation is also a big problem for, for you. 
I think the regulation, if anything, it disrupts. It's a bit of a, um, it's a bit of a dichotomy. I think a lot of startups will say that you're overburdening us with regulation, and we shouldn't have so much regulation and all that. I think, from our experience, you want more regulation. You want stricter regulation because stricter regulation will be able to come after the bad practices of the incumbents. If you're trying to disrupt the market, we launched property insurance about six months ago, so we're basically going against the banks. The banks have been bundling this product with a home mortgage and forcing it to buy insurance. European regulation and Greek regulation doesn't allow them to do that. It doesn't allow you to bundle the product. It doesn't allow you to enforce somebody to buy a specific product. Now, as a challenger coming into the market, obviously they didn't like it. It's a very profitable market for them. So what we would argue is that you want more regulation, you want fair regulation, and you want strict regulation across the board. You don't want less. If that, uh, it's a very sensitive point, but I think it's a very important one, at least in our sector. Uh, Mr. Fantasis, I want to thank you. And I will go uh, to Dimitris Litsikakis, who is also going after, I think, the big boys here, uh, before blockchain did, maybe. Uh, so um, we are very excited to have you in our sessions representing Revolut. Um, it's beyond the traditional bank. So uh, actually, you incorporate this technology and uh, you make it a different business um, close to what blockchain could do. Um, I want to ask you, what do you think are the trends that we're going to see in the forthcoming years and uh, how easy it is for you to enter this market, which is actually already regulated too? So thank you, Eva, uh, for the question and thank you all for being here today. Um, well, Revolut started with a vision to, to turn the, the financial system upside down. It started four years ago for the only reason, um, you know, that the, the, the banks were broken. What was the three main issues with banking, uh, uh, even today? It's expensive. Anybody in this room that's uh, tried to send money abroad had this experience because they had to pay substantial fees. Or when you try to, to exchange your currency in, uh, from euros to any other, you have substantial fees. Then it's also inconvenient. When you try to open a bank account, and when you uh, factor in things like the unbanked and they're, they're trying to open a bank account, you get all this paperwork, which is very, very difficult to, to get. And then, of course, it's um, what we call it, banking is a little bit sneaky. Why? Because they're not very transparent. They have all these hidden fees, and you don't know uh, in the end what you are paying for. So Revolut started to um, address all these problems one by one by offering a 10 times better product at, and at the same time, 10 times cheaper. So this is the, the real disruption there. You know, we're not probably building something. We are broken, breaking down all the processes and, and different supply chain factors from the banking system, and we are improving them drastically. Um, so for example, we added cryptocurrency. No other bank is doing that. Um, we added insurance. So we are offering through the app a very convenient way to insure your phone and also travel insurance. So in a, in a way, we are building a, a massive scale of users. We have about 4 uh, million users um, in the last four years. And we are constantly adding, them, ad adding value to these uh, users with different um, services. Um, the next thing that we are going to disrupt is investing by uh, building the, the first um, commission-free trading platform in Europe. So that means that anybody who has you know, some, some money on the side and they want to invest, but they're not super rich and they cannot afford all these uh, fees that are tied with the investing, they can just tap on a button through their smartphone and do it. So how do we do it? Like the, the disruption in this case is actually rethinking banking from scratch. So a lot of banks say we are uh, digital first. Well, we are digital only. Like we don't have any kind of um, um, branches. Simply, if you want to go to a branch, you, you can't. Uh, if you want to call somebody at Revolut, you can. It's just app-based, and it's, it's, it's a chat-based system. So think about it. We are sending uh, all-day all messages to each other, but when it comes to banking, I have to call somebody, and I have to wait 10 minutes for somebody to pick up the, the phone. Why can't I just type some, some question? And of course, by providing artificial intelligence, our bot can, um, can answer more than 25% of, of all the incoming uh, questions and provide an instant response. So this is the way that you, know, you start to rethink all these inconvenient things and you massively improve it. Improve them. 
And you also, from uh, uh, what I know, you already also work uh, with uh, Elas Direct already. Correct. And I understand that to manage to succeed this growth so fast, you actually adapt faster to the disruption and uh, you included cryptocurrencies uh, faster than uh, uh, to build your own model. So um, what is the basic um, uh, differentiation of uh, your approach to a traditional bank? Why should somebody trust your services and not a bank? Because if he wants to go there and there is nothing, mm -hmm. they feel yeah. they, they want to see your face, no? Yeah. So that's why I'm here, I'm putting a face. <laughs> You're the face of that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, jo jokes apart, we are, um, as an e-money institution, we are highly regulated by FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority. So it's not, you know, an app in Silicon Valley doing crazy things and you don't trust them. It's very highly regulated, uh, if probably even more than insurance. Um, and there is a team that is very strict in compliance. We, we, we invest a lot of money um, in, in, you know, securing the, the financial system around it. Um, and why should they, they, they go with Revolut? It's because it's much more convenient. You can do many more things with Revolut that your bank doesn't allow you to do it. Um, and you can, you know, just have some fun, you know, like um, it's even sending money with Revolut, it's so much easier. You, you can attach a GIF, you know, make it a fun experience. Because walking into a bank right now, you're feeling like, oh my God, you know, s something is going to be, you know, absolutely wrong with this experience. Uh, with Revolut, it's just your, your phone and you can do your banking 24-7, um, you know, at your living room, whatever. You don't even have to do anything. Thank you. Um, I think it's very exciting. I've already downloaded uh, everything <laughs> I needed to. Great. I'm setting up my profile. Um, I want to go to... A very um, interesting story now because we have a whiskey brand with us. Mr. Uh, Ganesh Algan, thank you so much for accepting the invitation. And I understand that you're developing an innovative and impactful digital strategy. So it's not very easy because it's a more traditional sector and to try to adapt to, to this disruption. Um, so I wanted to understand, first of all, how can you move to the social impact world and trying to do good and basically um, fundamentally look to disrupt also uh, businesses. How, how can you do that? Yeah, no, uh, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. And um, I know you all came for the free whiskey. I apologize. Uh, um, my team didn't sort that out, but uh, next time we'll be able to do that. But I think before I start, if I don't mind showing a video, just to explain the Shivers Venture, which is what I wanted to talk about. They say success in business is chasing cash, eat or be eaten, and building your own empire. But it can be more than that. Blending profit with purpose, chasing solutions to change lives, making money and making the world a better place. That's why every year, the Shivers Venture gives away $1 million with no strings attached to social entrepreneurs, future thinkers, risk takers, ceiling smashers, and world savers. Like Jamal who turns the homeless into coffee baristas, Oscar who turns plastic into bricks, or Jalila who turns into sustainable fabrics. Because success is a blend in business and in scotch. Shivers, blended scotch whiskey. I'm a marketer so we love advertising so I apologize for that. Um, so basically, I think your question is, the, the key thing that we're seeing in traditional marketing is we're really being challenged to become brand activists, and you'll be hearing a lot about this. It's kind of the new form of marketing that's really um, dominating at the moment. And a study that happened uh, last year by Edelman on Earned Brand is talking about 64% of consumers will make a decision about their brand based on their social stance. And that's increased by 13% from the year before, uh, 13 points from the year before. That's incredible. So a lot of consumers out there think that a lot of brands actually have a lot of power to change the way we behave even more than some governments, which is quite interesting. But I think they believe that brands should be doing a lot more in terms of building that, and hence why the Shivers Venture was, was created. We were a bit ahead of the curve because we, we started this five years ago, um, and digital has really been the enabler for us for that. So, you know, we've, we've had about, in terms of from the application process, in terms of reviewing these businesses, um, everything's been done from a digital format, and we've built a real base uh, in terms of digital, so last year we had about 
188 million impressions on the Shivers Venture website, um, half a million social engagement. So the platform is huge. But what it does is allow to showcase and celebrate these social entrepreneurs who definitely need the help in terms of disruption, both from the way they're building their businesses, but also the way they're showcasing their businesses. So we really felt like it's a two-way win. I'm not going to say here we're doing good and it's not to do with business sales or performance, of course, but what we believe in is blending profit with purpose. So purpose is important, but we want these businesses to be able to become scalable, you know, really see market opportunities, and our disruption is very confronting. So we might give the million uh, fund, which is already a big thing, but I think the added value is the fact that we get business leaders, we work with uh, Oxford University, um, their Centre for Social Entrepreneurship called Skoll. Uh, we work with uh, the Next Web Conference in Amsterdam, which is a big digital forum uh, with a lot of tech entrepreneurs. We bring all these people together in order to build a, a hub for these entrepreneurs to, to blossom. And that's, that's fundamentally where we've seen the benefit. And obviously that is going to build back to the equity of our brand. And why with Shivers? Well, our founders were two brothers who were actually entrepreneurs and they, they uh, did great business by building a shop and obviously a great whiskey. So uh, hopefully you agree with the same thing. But I think ultimately they gave back to the community and, uh, and that's why we, we built this. So uh, I would li like also to ask you, what is the disruption that occurred to lead to running the venture also as a non-traditional uh, marketing program? Because I understand you're moving into the venture now, or yeah. you have also a venture. Yeah. And uh, this is quite interesting. Nobody would expect that. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, we could easily go and say, let's just invest in traditional media, uh, you know, advertising and put the money in there. Or we could have easily gone, people have asked us, why don't you just fund a cause and, you know, you, you, you sort of tick the box of, brand activism, but what we've seen is the real impact is to, is to you know, support these businesses that, that need help because they're, you know, ultimately they're reaching one million people that they've impacted in, in 40 countries. They're almost a vehicle that we're showing good. People just don't want people to talk anymore. They don't want brands to do the talking. They want to walk the walk. And it's really important. And for us, the digital space has been incredible in terms of starting conversation. It's not a one-way conversation. And that investment is much more important. And we're seeing that impact, like I said, with the numbers that we're reaching. Uh, for a brand point of view, it's much more um, efficient than using traditional form in that, in that investment. So do you have one success story to share with us of the venture that demonstrates what you're talking about, a positive impact of disruption? Yeah, I mean, one of them is WeFarm, which won the competition a couple of years ago from the UK. And they basically use an app in order to connect small-scale farmers around the world. Um, and when they came to us, they only had 20,000, which is still a great number for them. Uh, but eventually, after, immediately after the venture final, when they won it, they went up to 60,000. And then this was two years ago. Now they have one million farmers that, that, have, uh, that have been impacted. So, you know, digital as an enabler for those small-scale farmers, it's incredible how many communities, as you guys would all know, are requiring the digital enabler to disrupt. And, and we, we, the fact that we can help these guys build and build scale is, is probably one of our big success stories. Okay, politicians have competition. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Let me see, uh, we have some questions from the audience now. You can also uh, make your questions on Eventora uh, or just ask questions now. Do we have anybody from the audience that would like to ask a question? I have several already. I will start to break the ice and I will ask. Uh, first of all, if I may, uh, Bashim, you talk about the unbanked people and you're in Greece. So do you see any opportunity here or not? Uh, yes, the, even though uh, Greece for us is not a target market. Actually, what happened is the reason my story why I actually came to Greece a few years ago was that I was looking for talent. And I mm. came across a very small company, very innovative. Uh, on the technology side, but did not understand the opportunity in the emerging markets. So I actually acquired that business, and we've grown it now to almost 200 people from a 12-people company. And um, so for me, Greece is the hub, if you like, for, the, for, the, for this global business that we um, have today. Um, there's still, just to give you an idea, I mean, the, the, the microfinance market size in emerging markets was estimated by Citibank to be $100 billion. Last year, we transacted $1.5 billion only in terms of the scale. So just imagine, we are just at 1.5% of the potential in the emerging markets. So from a businessman perspective, I, I think primarily the focus will remain for us uh, so the banks and everyone have nothing to worry about us yet in Greece, but uh, who knows what happens in the next few years. 
Okay. <laughs> I, I wish we'll you could <laughs> <laughs> invest more. So, uh, Alexi, I want also to ask you. Um, you are in Greece. Uh, you you know how to be creative. You ha you ha you brought here a business model that was uh, very interesting, like so many years ago. Um, do you use now new technologies? Do you use artificial intelligence? Do you use predictive models? Uh, how do you plan to adapt? Because it's a transforming world. Everything is happening super fast. Yeah, I think it's important to keep uh, recruiting talent because ultimately that's where the new ideas and new cutting edge technology is being created from. We have our own internal data analytics team, which is split between Greece and Cyprus. We have our own uh, software developers. Most of them are typically people that have are originally from here or from Cyprus that went to London, went to the US, studied, worked there for four or five years, and then came back. So I think being plugged into the latest technologies is definitely important. Um, I think when you when you think about businesses like our the insurance industry or the casino industry, which is not dissimilar, or the betting industry, it's all about understanding data and being able to quickly react to changes in risk. It's exactly the same model. The fact that you're paying somebody for a crash of a car or a burning down of a house versus winning in, uh, in a casino, it's more or less the same bet, but the settlement of that bet is very different. So on the, to answer your question, on the, um, the cutting-edge technology and artificial intelligence, yes, we use a lot of that, although all of these are kind of buzzwords that are being overused these days. I think it is important to stay plugged into universities, so we have a, a lot of strategic partnerships globally with different universities, and we get a lot of experience from there. But more importantly is to keep investing in your people and make sure that the people that you hire are glued in with what is the latest that is happening. You're not gonna get breakthrough artificial intelligence innovation out of Greece, I'm afraid to say. It's gonna be out of Canada, where they've been doing it since the 1960s, it's gonna be out of the US. The question is how do you quickly assimilate that and bring it over here? Okay, thank you for that. So maybe I should ask also, Dimitri, um, is, are the Greeks trusting your services? Do you see that uh, in this market we have maybe uh, problems with our financial system? Well, in, in countries that uh, the banks have problems, that's where Revolut is enjoying the, the, the greatest growth. And that happens in, in Cyprus. They had the bail-in, of course. In Malta, exactly the same thing. They, they had the bank closed overnight. So they're kind of looking for alternatives. So the, the, when, when we launched the office um, last year, we had about 50,000 users. Um, now we have more than 200,000 users. But how can you do that? I think the answer is to bring, uh, you know, make, make banking sexy again, if it was sexy ever. <laughs> but anyway, if I, if I have the time to play one video as well, and I'll show you how we do sexy uh, at Revolut. <laughs> yeah, no. Do you have it? No? Ah, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, it's anyways, it's <laughs> it, you have to be very creative and you have to, um, to, to, to talk in a way that your audience understands. No more, you know, hey, Mr. Litsikakis, uh, we are uh, here to inform you, but, you know, just just talk to to people like like you would talk to your friend. Use uh, emojis or use you know uh, normal language. This is what uh, um, people like, and that's why they they love the brand, any kind of brand that does that, and they actually become ambassadors. We we see th this love being you know transposed into the the growth, and actually we don't spend uh, so much money in marketing because. Um, it's a case study of word of mouth marketing. And we take all this, uh, this budget and we throw it back to the product. We make it even better and people keep talking about it. So. Thank you for that. Uh, you see, uh, technologies fail sometimes, so uh, <laughs> it's good to be able to do that. And um, I don't know if we have any more questions. I can just have one more comment from Ari and just ask you, so doing good. Is it something that people like? Do you see that it changes how public opinion sees a brand like yours? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, we've, we've done quite a bit of research in terms of um, how it's impacting Shivers as a brand. I think the key thing is it has to be authentic. Um, and it has to, thankfully, in our brand values, which is about sort of the generosity piece, which I told you from a heritage point of view, it needs to feel linked. I think people can, can mind my language, um, cut through the bullshit basically. And so if you're going to do something like that, it's, it's quite risky. It's a very fine line. But because we're doing it, we've been doing it and we've committed to it. You know, we've put a, a lot of money behind it. 
people see that, and to your point about word of mouth, that's what's really driving for us. So absolutely, and we haven't, you know, like I said, it's about blending profit with purpose. We're not saying we're all about charity. You know, we expect something from those businesses that we work with about building business because that's how we, what we do. We, we build business doing good. So as long as it's authentic, um, it's absolutely working for us as a brand. Okay, you save us from, from work. Yes, if that's a short one. Yeah, good question. So, because we're um, a global business, but because we the, the, the finalists come from different countries, so the countries are set up in a way that can build metrics to understand uh, how the venture affects the, the, the brand itself overall. So, we have done research, you know, from, uh, from Mexico to the US where there's definitely a, an increase. You know, we can, you can never directly link to sales, right, because sales can be impacted by your commercial strategy and all that. But from an equity point of view, you can definitely see the propensity for people to go, you know what, I'm reappraising this brand in a different way because of this, of this uh, property. So um, that's one thing. And then obviously the social reach and all those impact metrics that we're seeing uh, in terms of what it's building as a community, again, through the word of mouth uh, is massive for us. So they're sort of the two ways we could we can understand that. Okay, so you helped me also finish with the session because um, I, you, you talked about actually social consciousness by a company and I started with, uh, with Volvo cars and um, I heard that they said we should have no one killed or seriously injured uh, by 2020 in the car that they use that has the services they, they offer. So I think this is uh, what's becoming more important, doing good and profit. And I think this is also something we're trying to impose. We try to make sure that businesses will do the same. So you will not be discriminated from an insurance company um, if you are not, you know, um, the best, if you have some issues, so we have to make sure that people will not be excluded. And it's not just about the profit, it's about also um, uh, keeping values here, especially in Europe. So I would like to thank you all because I think it's a, a very positive message at this point. And um, we do have an amazing next session. It's basically about data. So everything you do has a basis on, on data, this disruption. Um, it's going to be my data is my weakness. So we were the positive ones. And thank you. <laughs> thank you for that.